Hello my Juicy Co-Creators, Lilu here on the Juicy Living Tour and today I'm in Chicago in Illinois with Carolyn Mace. Hi! Hi, how nice to be with you. Thank you, and who do we have here? This is my dog, Abby. This is Abby. Yeah, Abby Abby goes where I go and as you know, she's very jealous of people who come in the house so we have to, this is, we're stuck. <laughs> <laughs> Well, she has a wonderful presence, and so have you, Carolyn. It's it's so um, amazing to be sitting here. Uh, it's pr- pretty surreal. It feels pretty surreal. You are internationally well known um, for your um, mystical teachings. Thank you. <laughs> Around the world, you have five New York Times bestsellers. Yeah, yeah, yeah I do. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. And uh, you keep on bringing new information, and I'm very interested to start this conversation by what is your current view of the world and what's happening right now in the spiritual world? Are you saying it's a spiritual crisis? Well, you know, um, as you know, we were talking before the interview started, and I think that um, what how I, how we're going to approach this is with, through the analogy of um, a condominium building and that every floor offers us a different perspective on the same neighborhood mm-hmm. and that the penthouse is the, is the perspective that has the most spectacular view. It's the one least attached to the ground, the one that has the greatest cosmic view um, and when you're on the ground, of course, you see the least amount of the cosmic. So with that in mind, every floor, you get a different perspective, and each one in its own way is valid. Right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So from that point of view, let's say this, that I think that in the history of civilization, and, and I love history, that's my, my avocation, um, there have been great times of upheaval in all civilis, in all rather societies, whether you look to Asia and China, which has a magnificent history, or, or uh, uh, Europe. But in other times of transition, like the Renaissance, or the, from the plague to the Renaissance, to the Industrial Age, to the Age of Exploration, certain fundamental pillars of society remained intact. The the Renaissance, for example, or the age of the Industrial Age, did not bring down the pillars of uh, the fundamental pillars of the church, or the pillars of, shall we say, banking, or the pillars of um, the structure of nations, the sovereignty of nations. Nor did they touch ecology, nor were species screaming for their lives, nor were we running out of fuel, nor were we being pursued by an element that could terrorize, if not end, all of civilization, should it get into the hands of an archetype that really was not on the loose back then called the terrorist. So we could say, that we are at a pivotal moment in the history of civilization, civilization, unlike any time ever. And that is true. This time, it is a global call to force that in which the forces that are facing us, the challenges that are facing us, exist at every single level of life from air to water, to species, to the end of the oil age, to the end of the fossil age, to the beginning of the solar age, there is absolutely nothing that is, no stone will be unturned in this age of chaos that we are in. And we are kidding ourselves to think that a positive attitude is sufficient to to navigate these waters. It is not. So when I, I look at what is facing us, the boundaries of nations are falling to shreds. The currency system 
cannot hold us intact. We are not facing problems. Problems have solutions. We're facing predicaments. Predicaments don't have solutions. They sweep us up with them. And they reshape us. And we, we have for centuries worshipped at the altar of reason. We have finally reached, like as we entered the age of reason, the Renaissance 500 years ago, where we thought reason was the key to everything. We could reason with God. We started to speak in terms of, I wonder what the reason is for this. I wonder, technical difficulties, I wonder what the reason is for that. I wonder what God's reason is. Projecting the idea that whatever off-planet force there is, it had a reasoning capacity like ours, but probably times 100. Mm -hmm. We have now reached the end of the age of reason, where the size of our challenges have indeed become unreasonable, which means we are unable to reason with them. We cannot reason with climate change. You cannot legislate the climate and, and decide with this idiotic Congress of ours that we are going to write a bill and demand that the glaciers stop melting. We cannot do that. But these are the methods that we've, or have back, back room meetings and, and come up with some meeting with Rupert Murdoch and some clandestine group and decide that we're going to stop the air from being toxic or stop the Fukushima uh, fallout from in fact contaminating the rest of Japan and that we can stop that by in fact stopping the news from coming into the United States and other countries so that hopefully the general public will forget that they are in fact being nuked. Now this is the state of events that, and the state of the world that we are indeed living in. And when I look at what's facing us, there are endless crises that are only getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's how I see the world. We have, we have reached, indeed, the end of the age of reason. And to some extent, the beginning of the age of the new barbarian. Because simultaneously, there are uprisings in the Middle East. There are uprisings in America. The shooting of a congressman. The screaming for guns everywhere. Mm -hmm. Where there are more guns owned by the civilian population than ever before. This is the preparation for revolt. And not an organized one, but a hysterical one. They, and they expect this to happen. Let me be very clear here. They expect it. Hmm. They expect it. Which is why the Patriot Act was put into place. So this uprising of the general global village, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Because the division, if you know history, you know that when the, the French Revolution, the, when the division of power reaches a polar opposite mm -hmm. to such an extent, it will snap. And that's what will happen. Mm. And on a spiritual level, what do you think is happening right now for the spiritual community? We were having, we're talking a little bit how we're not very grounded here. There's a lot of fluff going on? Well, I think, you know, the first wave of the spiritual community was um, first, I think, what is your def what, what is your definition of the spiritual community? When you say that, what are you talking about? That's a good question. Actually, I should have asked you before to define it because well, this what is. Are you talking about? Because that's a broad. That that's a broad. That's like saying, "What do I think of academia?" And I would have to say, "What are you talking about? Are you talking about the Eastern schools? Are you talking? What are you off, online community? What are you talking about when you say spiritual community?" 
I'm referring to the uh, authors, the healers, the practitioners, the the people awakening to understanding that um, um, thoughts and our thoughts create our reality and that there is so much more than just this physical body, that there is a divine um, connection and that we are emerging as one facet of God in its creation and its manifestation here on earth. And some of us are waking up a little bit compared to the materialistic side that we were maybe born into and seeing that there is energy, there is uh, divinity, that there is uh, transformation possible, that there is so much more than 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 a, a rigid concept of life or a train train de vie as we say in french mm -hmm. okay well um you said some very interesting things um first um the spiritual community uh what you described waking up to this understanding of god um in a sense, the redefining of God was hijacked by the mental world, by the intellectual world. And in a sense, it's no different than what the theologians did. They simply put it in different jargon and, des and decided to redo their definition of God in the same way Aquinas did the same way Augustine did, in the same way Tillich did, uh, or Nietzsche, or, or whomever took on the task of deciding to script what that world is. What is the difference between that and what we've done? Okay, We've decided to give different attributes to God, and what we decided to do was equate God with healing, because mm -hmm. we like the God of healing. They liked the God of philosophy and a much more philosophical God. But we tossed that one out, and in its place, we resurrected the healing temples and decided that the God of healing was much more appropriate for us because we became much more emotional in these last 50 years. And thus, what we did was we merged our personal healing with spirituality. But in fact, the spiritual path and healing do not go hand in hand. Mm. And that was never the spiritual path. Mm. And when someone says energy, which is the word you used, that's not the word you use because there's nothing sacred about the word energy. Energy is a light bulb. Energy is what you're exhausted from. You don't, energy does not evoke from you a sense of reverence. It doesn't make you go, oh. it doesn't make you realize in the same way that the person sitting opposite of you is a God being. Whereas, if I said, don't use that word again, use grace. Now you have to say, my grace is exhausted. My grace is exhausted. What you would realize is a nap does not recharge your grace. Prayer does. You need to pray. Now, very few people get that in the New Age field. Mm. They just don't. And that's the true spiritual path, where you get that, my grace is exhausted. I need a devotion that puts my grace front and center that every choice I make is either a choice to grace you or to withhold it. Mm. And if I withhold it, I need to account to myself as to why I have done that. And if I withhold it, there's only a handful of reasons why. One is greed. I'm greedy. I do not want to bless you because I know that in supporting you, I fear that you will get more than me, and I will not do that. And I have to hold myself accountable to that. And further, I then have to go into the theology of physics, which is 
And if I believe what is in one is in the whole, I have to apologize to the whole. Because I can't just live that truth conveniently, can I? That really has to become my theology. I have to say, or I have to finally add, that if I believe what is in one is in the whole, that has to become my living theology, not just a sweet little attitude with energy. Mm -hmm. So long as you speak energy, you will never speak prayer mm. because you won't have to because there's no reverence there. If you speak energy, you, you, can't, you won't be at that mystical altitude because it's just too high for you. That's the penthouse. Mm. You just can't take it. It's too high. You just can't see everybody yet as part of you. It's too much. You still have to see yourself as better than others, separate from this, and you think, I'll get there one day, but not yet. I need the 10th floor. Mm -hmm. I need to still think in terms of energy. But that's the true spiritual path, where you then say, what's with me that I can't grace somebody? Is it greed? Is it, is it too much anger in my heart? Is it a wrathful heart? Is it entitlement? Do I, what John of the Cross calls luxury? Do I feel that I'm entitled to more? I know what it is. I can't bear to have an ordinary life. God, make me anything, but don't make me ordinary. Please, God, don't make me ordinary. Just the thought of it makes me sick. And when I see ordinary people, my skin crawls to think I might be one of them. And the truth spiritual path is a path of humbleness. And the very thought of being humiliated and a truth spiritual path, mm -hmm. I fear being humiliated, and I'm not going there. Mm -hmm. So instead, I'll go the mental route and create the God I want with my own thoughts, because a mystical experience slaps me to my knees and says, don't you dare create me. I created you. What was then your dark night of the soul? Because you were originally a journalist, and then you became a medical intuitive, an author, um, and you teach people all around the world internationally. So was there that moment where you were really humbled and on your knees? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you share that experience with us for a moment? No. <laughs> I, I, I mean, people... I don't know why anybody would benefit from my own hell. Um, I, I don't know if I would call it that, but I think... Or the opening or what you got in that moment. You know what I think? I think that... Um, um, I went through seizures. Okay. And when I went through a couple of years of seizures. Um, I thought that I would end up dependent, back home. I had no idea if I was facing a brain tumor because brain tumors run in my family. I have a cousin dealing with one. My uncle passed away of one. I just, I thought now it's my turn. Um, the vulnerability of thinking any minute in front of anyone, it could happen, and it did, and it has. I mean, I had a um, seizure in a restaurant. I had a seizure in a hotel. One time I was being interviewed, and I could feel one coming on, and I excused myself, and the next thing you know, I was unconscious under the sink. And... At the end of that nightmare, and it was a nightmare, I broke my forehead open. I, it was a nightmare. Because you, you tumble, I shouldn't say you, I tumbled into more and more helplessness. And I'm not accustomed to being helpless or dependent or uh, any of the terrifying things that um, seizures bring on someone. Mm. 
okay it is literally like having a gun in your head it is living the game of Russian roulette 24 7 at the top of your stairs will I make it down will I make it through the shower without drowning it is 24 7 okay and I really thought about I'm never teaching again but I'm a superb teacher I thought about just withdrawing and writing which would have been fine to be honest with you I don't have any problem with that but the reason I withdraw I had a problem with you know it's one thing to retire and say you know what I'm not going to teach anymore because I'm in my 50s now and I've had enough of being on the road it's another thing to withdraw because you're terrified to be on the road I, c I could not deal with that. If that were the d reason I made that decision, I would not be able to tolerate that. What I learned through this um, is how, f how terrible it is to be frightened. And I've never seen people the same. I get it. You know, the whole, I get it. Yeah. What um, what would you say really moves you right now? What are you present to in this moment? Oh, that's a big question. You know, I really, at this age of my life, there's something really gracious about getting older. Um, when you don't have to worry about... Uh, um, the things of life that really distract you. And I think sometimes that, that is why, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have children of my own, but of course you see my household. It's filled with my, my nieces and, and, and uh, the kids are always here and I'm always involved in their lives, so they are my kids. And, but I don't have, and I'm very grateful, I don't have to attend to children that are sick. And I don't have to attend to um, a level of life's problems that drain me 24 hours a day. I'm very blessed in that regard. And so, you know, you get, I got to a point where when I reached my 50s, where I said, I don't want problems that are just insignificant. I, I, I just, I don't want to be bothered. I don't want to be bothered with friends that are not friends, really. I don't have very many of those. I have really good friends. Some that go back to when I was 13. That's a long time. Okay? It's older than you. Mm -hmm. And I don't have time to make a lot of new friends now. Because it takes a long time to seed those friendships, to develop a history with people. And I'd rather continue to nurture the history that I have spent so many years building now with those people. And I've made a conscious decision to do that. I've made a real conscious decision to um, spend as much time with my family. I won't have another one, okay? They're important people to me. I've made a real conscious decision to deepen my spiritual life. I need that. I've made a conscious decision to do what I can for this world because I really think that's what little I can contribute is the reason I'm here. And I, and I think that, you know, every person, either you deal with your fate or your destiny, you're going to, it's going to be one of the two sides of that. And how well, you, if you manage your destiny well, then your destiny will do its work for you. 
and however it melts into the fabric of the whole and weaves its way through the future, the lives of people you will never meet, the many people who will see all the wonderful interviews you're doing with all these wonderful people from all over the world. Someone will be sitting on a couch and, and turn on these interviews and they'll watch Wayne or they'll watch some other of my colleagues and wonderful people. And maybe you won't even realize you've saved a life or a life is saved. or, And then that person in turn will do this or that. You've set wheels upon wheels upon wheels of goodness in motion by following and just doing your destiny. And I, I don't think people realize the power that that is by staying on their destiny. It has so much power. But, you know, someone will say, well, what can I do? I'm only one person. They don't realize everybody's only one person. But if they sat back and said, but look what, look what, Stalin did. He was only one person. Look what Hitler did. He was only one person. Look what Bin Laden did. He was, and look what Golda Meir did. And look what Mandela did. And look what Martin Luther King did. All of these people. Look what Charles Dickens did. I mean, look what Shakespeare did. They were only one person too. But all of them in some way changed the world. So this excuse, I'm only one person, is something so meager, so weak, so cowardly that I, 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 I want to take somebody and put their head in a toilet for seven minutes when someone says that to me. Hmm. I simply find that to be the words of a coward. It takes courage to live on this path. Well, yeah, but, you know, what, what is your option? You're either going to live courageously or you're going to be a coward. Which one do you want? Every single person is going to face their challenges, whether in my case it was seizures. Other people, other women have breast cancer or they have the whatever, whatever. This is a life that's filled with challenges. And they're going to be, that's it. And anybody who acts like they're shocked when their challenges come along, I, I often say to them, well, what did you expect? Did you expect that your life would not have something? What were you thinking? What were you thinking? Life is about preparing for the fact that one day it's going to be you. These are destructible items we're living in. We are living in vessels that are designed to disintegrate. Spirituality, the spiritual path, is a path about, you know, people, people don't get, they just do not get the spiritual path. The whole emphasis of the monks and the nuns, whether Buddhist or Christian, which is about non-worldliness, they don't understand that non-worldliness is actually a mystical concept, far more than physical. People are so filled with their stuff. I got to have stuff. I have to have more stuff. Where's my stuff? You know, they can't bear not to have stuff, right? And, and I, you know, everybody wants a roof over their head. I mean, and, and very few people wanna, want to have just a, a, a one suitcase and say, this is my whole world. I mean, let's face it, but. Apart from this one. Right, apart from you, right. <laughs> But one day that won't be true. Mm -hmm. One day you will want to say, I need to know where I live. You know, and, 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 um, and it's wonderful that you, that the globe is your, is your home now. You know, at your age, I could do that. Um, but my, my point there is that the whole reason and this was the teaching of Jesus, to be in the world, but not of the world. Mm. The idea was, have all you want, but if that stuff has you, now you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Because what that means is that 
the stuff world owns you mm -hmm. and it can make you sell yourself mm -hmm. and uh, in order to keep the stuff and that's when you become the devil's weapon mm -hmm. that's when you will do dark things and lie to yourself that you're not doing dark things that's when you start telling lies, or you start stealing, or you start harming others, or you start making decisions that you know will cause another person's life to suffer. And you'll start telling yourself, well, that's just business. Mm -hmm. Well, business is business. And you hide under that adage, as if that excuses what you should say is, I made a selfish choice, and your life is going to suffer, and you know what? I don't care, and that's what's true. I simply wanted more money mm -hmm. instead of admitting what's true. And I'm a dark, greedy, horrible person mm -hmm. instead of admitting what's true. The true spiritual path is about developing a soul that says, I can't go that route. I'm tempted. Lead me not into temptation. Because if I go that route, I could become that person. And I can't. That's the spiritual path. It's not about imagining and just having these wispy little silly thoughts. It's about going into your darkness and getting a hold of it day after day after day. And if you get hold of your darkness, then you find your light and you're not afraid to shine your light on other people, never mind yourself, on other people as well as yourself. Otherwise, you'll be selfish with your light. You'll be afraid to empower another person because you'll think, what if they have more than me? Oh, no, no, no. What if they become more famous than me? I can't do it. And then you'll never know how much power you have to heal another person because you're just too selfish to find out. Wow, what an amazing conversation. This is really juicy. <laughs> the um, the healing part, the healing aspect, how do you define healing? You're making someone better. I mean, I think real healers, genuinely gifted, and here would be the word I'm choosing deliberately, anointed healers are rare, very, very rare okay and by that i mean people who have the grace where the grace is running through them and it's the type of grace where when they put their hand on you or work on you your illness is gone it's gone or they begin they put a charge through you of grace of such high potency that they start a healing process and your healing occurs within a time zone that is considered by ordinary standards to be, quote, a miracle. And by we call miracle when something happens outside the ordinary framework of time and space. Mm -hmm. And we call that a miracle. However, if you understand how grace works and mystical laws. Mystical laws simply are laws that um, negotiate the laws of nature on your behalf, specifically on your behalf, as a result of prayer and faith. Wow. Um. What are some of those healers? Is there a few names that comes to your mind? Well, let me go back to Wayne Dyer. I told Wayne Dyer about Padre Pio, for example. Mm -hmm. And what makes them a saint is not is is that they knew these laws. They they went through the ordeals essential to become someone who could manage, who had a soul with enough stamina to deal with the timeless realm, the kairos realm of the non-physical world and transition it through their form into the physical. They had to be wired for that, okay? 
It was what Jesus could do. And he said, this and other things you could do, you're just not listening to me. Mm. All right, you're just not listening. Buddha said the same thing. I'm just a finger pointing to the moon if you paid attention. So don't turn me into a god. And Jesus never said he was a god. Mm -hmm. And none of this nonsense that they do in the church. He suffered for you. No, he didn't. He suffered for reasons other than they make it sound like some off-planet God wanted a bloody sacrifice. It's completely pagan, the way they interpret why he died. Completely pagan, which is why the message has never somehow or other penetrated. It's a, such a bold thing for me to say. Such a bold. So I have to, to, to parameter this and say, this is my personal belief, a deeply held personal belief. Mm -hmm. But what he did say was, these and other things you can do. And that's not my personal belief. That's just classic scripture. He said, if you only get what I'm doing, I'm not doing anything. If you understood what I'm teaching you, I'm teaching you about these laws. I'm teaching you these laws and how to access them. You're just so stupid. That's my comment. He didn't quite say that, but he must have thought it. I'm adding that. Mm. Where do you think you are in your mystical journey? I, I don't know how to answer that. I don't know that there's an R-ness. I mean, I don't know where I am. I, I haven't got a clue how to answer that. I don't know where that is there a line? How do you, how do you, you are here? I mean, I don't even know what that, um, I, I, How do you feel in connection to God? Well, you know when something becomes a constant, it's a constant. It's a constant. It's my con, it's a constant. And, uh, I think I've gotten to the point where I don't talk about it. It just is? It just is. I, I've i gotten to the point now where I prefer not to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I, it's now entered the Carmelite part of my life. Huh. You know, it's behind closed doors now. Uh -huh. And I, I, that's it. Yeah. It's not, it's not something I want to talk about. Yeah. Do you think there is that we should um, maybe more consider it sacred, the, this, the sacredness of all of this, all of us? Like there's a tendency right now that we are opening up a lot and sharing a lot throughout the web, throughout all medias and, and um, in life. And maybe it's too much. Maybe there should be the sacred space and the heart, there's the no sacredness. Now you're just coming into this. Mm -hmm. This has been going on. Mm -hmm. We're trying to catch up here. Yeah, you're just <laughs> and more. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're just coming in. I'm 20 years older than you. Trust me when I tell you, uh -huh. this has been going on. Uh -huh. Okay, and now with the web, it's just getting webinized. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is not new. Mm -hmm. This sharing, this this has been going on. This emoting. Okay. Um. I always go back to the classical, mystical way, mm -hmm. both monastic-wise and how it was handled within the monasteries. Why? Because that's where the wisdom is. Monastic wisdom is monastic wisdom for a reason. It has nothing to do with church rules like Vatican politics or, or any of this nonsense. I have no use for that. Monastic rules are universal in their wisdom. Nobody talks about their inner life, like over coffee. With, it's, it, I mean, if I were to, for example, compare it, people are more prone to protect their computer password with more sacredness than they are their spiritual life. What does that tell you? 
that surely is part of the picture that you painted at the beginning of the video of this interview. <laughs> what does that tell you? Where are your values? There's a lot of emptiness. Well, where are your values? Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. One's nothing but chatter. Mm -hmm. You don't chat. If you actually really had a mystical experience, I promise you, it wouldn't be on the... Vi it would not be on, on, on your internet. You'd be on your knees. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't be chattering about it in the internet. Let me give you a comparison. Uh -huh. um, a lot of girls talk about being a mother. How they're going to be a mother. I'm going to be a mom. I'm going to be a mom. This is the kind of mom I'm going to be. And then they go out and they buy books on being a mom after they get married. And they go to these Lamaze classes so they can figure out how to breathe and all this other stuff. As if they're the first women on the earth to have babies. And how they're going to do everything and how they're going to be a mommy. And then the day comes and they actually give birth. And all that stuff becomes garbage. Nonsense. Because now they've gone through the actual experience not more pages that are flat and meaningless mm -hmm. and lifeless now they actually have the life it's actually become animated they actually have an experience and in that second they realize that you can take all those books and burn them mm -hmm. they're meaningless I actually know love. Mm. And for all the books that I've read, none of them could make my heart beat. You need an actual experience of God to bring you to your knees. You could read all about it. It won't get you there, honey. Mm. It just won't. Tell us what happens when the heart starts opening on a, on a spiritual level, on a mystical level even on a day-to-day -day operations and way of functionings and... You know, I, I think the best way I, I can put this, or, or one of the ways I can put this, I should say, is that in, in Judaism, in, he, in Yiddish, there's a word, rachmanes, or rachmanes, or, but I think it's rachmanes, and it means the, a kind of a mother compassion. It's, but it's a big heart compassion. It's a life com a compassion. Deep, 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 deep. Not empathy, not pity, but a heart that knows. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, That kind of heart opens up. That kind of heart opens up. With, when you look at someone's face, how it got to be that way, hmm. your heart recognizes. Your heart just recognizes it. You know the person, but you look and you think, oh, wow. And you are more inclined to pause for a moment and just say a prayer for them. Not a long one. Just a prayer like hover over them, God. That's all. Mm. Your heart feels for them. You don't want to rush out and solve their problems. Because you can't do that. And it's not your calling. That's not your calling. But you are called in that moment to pray for them. And I think if, if it's very hard to understand what the power of prayer is and how it works. It's very hard. And I think even when I was a young Catholic, baby Catholic. And, and let me be very clear. I, I, I left the whole Catholicism thing for many, many years. 
many years because the church, the actual politics of the church are so offensive to me. But when I was a baby Catholic, I used to think, I just do not get why. If there's this big God in the sky and all these saints, because, you know, Catholics have a saint for every day and every minute and every trick. You want to sell real estate? We got St. Joseph. You want to sell this one? You can do this. You did it. But I used to think, why doesn't God just wipe out all these bad people? Why doesn't he just, like, scoop them up with a big cosmic vacuum cleaner? And really, and put them on another galaxy. Here, go to the Pleiades, or, or go to Mars and battle it out, or you know, put all the Republicans on Mars or something. You know, please. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, why? You know. And while I haven't come to any final conclusion, what I what I have come to appreciate is that life is. Not like that. I mean, where, where you look for the presence of God are in all those tiny little endless um, constant nudges of, of, of gardens that happen all the time. Don't do this, don't say that. Do this, say that. Be here, create this. Wait for Andrew. Carl Andrew Harvey, what a good idea. One little thing after another after another. It's really not so little. Mm -hmm. Could be very big, could be very little, who knows. And I wrote Invisible Acts of Power, the story that really, really, really made an impression on me because it was so tiny, it was the story of this man who said I was going home to commit suicide. I was standing on the corner trying to figure out how to do it. Do I over... I had pills and I had a razor blade and I was thinking to myself you know I don't have maybe I don't have enough pills maybe maybe what I should do is combine them maybe I should take the pills first and then grab the razor blade but it wasn't quite sharp enough or maybe should I slice my wrist first and then take the pills and he said while I was having this debate with myself at the corner waiting to cross the street a woman drove up with her car and she and I waved to her and kind of flagged her and said go ahead and drive but instead she smiled at me and she said no you go ahead and he said her smile was so stunning that in that instant I decided to live and then she just drove by mm -hmm. now she must have been packing some grace she must have been packing some grace because to have the force to channel that kind of grace to make someone go whoosh, boom I think I'm going to live she'll never see him again he had a resurrection mm -hmm. and now he's gone about rebuilding his whole life and maybe he'll have a family now and maybe he'll bring through the souls that are meant to come through and they will have their children and their grandchildren and the generations will keep going that were meant to keep going through him mm -hmm. because she smiled mm -hmm. because she smiled you don't know what a big act is or a small it is not for us to judge mm -hmm. but to be present and to listen and when that voice said smile at him just smile. And a generation came from that smile. That's what you refer to also as weight, weightlessness? Yeah. And God in the details. What Teresa of Avila would say, God is in the small details of your life. Don't look for the big ones. The tiny voices. This, the every movement mm. of your life. The every thought. The every movement. The every leave if you truly truly are attuned this is your spiritual life this one the ever-present one that you must listen to this one not the one that says i need guidance because i need to know should i move here because i don't want to fail and i don't want to lose money and i don't want to be embarrassed i don't want to be humiliated be humiliated 
If I was your spiritual director, I'd make sure you were humiliated mm -hmm. to get it over with, mm -hmm. just to show you you're going to survive it. And then we can work on what really counts, which is the freedom of becoming a humble person. Because unless you're humble and you get how protective that is, you will never, ever, ever be free. Unfortunately, in the West, people associate humble with being poor when, in fact, humble is free. You need to have palaces. But if you're humble, you don't care. They can come and they can go. They can go up and they can go down. You can clean the refrigerator or be waited on. It doesn't matter to you because it never commands you. And that is the point. But the, if you are afraid of being humiliated, you will be arrogant and prideful. And that will be your downfall. What you're saying is that a lot, a lot of times people have jobs or they do things in life so that they, they uh, protect themselves from that humiliation or try to uh, and thus, shadow. And they never get to their destiny mm -hmm. because their fate If you are afraid to be humiliated, you will only live your fate. You'll never get to your destiny. Mm. Isn't that a wild thought? Mm. One that I have to, I think, uh, re-listen to. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not even registering at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody has it. Nobody wants to be humiliated. But here's the thing. People associate God with being humiliated. And you have to dwell on that and see how truthful, uh, how much truth is in that. Mm. They associate spiritual surrender with being humiliated because they mm. associate it with poverty and having everything taken from you and being humiliated and with suffering. And that's what people associate God with. That Absolutely. Which is why, I, I don't want to go there, I don't want to talk about prayer, and I, which is why whenever I brought up prayer and any kind of deep, true spirituality in my classes, People got defensive. They don't want to go there. Oh, they want to talk. That's why they made spirituality healing. Because they could control that. Because that's not the real spiritual path. Could we finish this video with a prayer? Would you be ready to do a prayer? Um, I, will, I would like to share a prayer that I just wrote, actually, but I have to get a copy of it. Yes, okay. let's get it. Mm-hmm. Okay, I wrote this prayer um, as part of a newsletter that I send out uh, because I have a, a monthly salon and then I write a newsletter. And I wrote this on um, on prayer uh, and on truth because I see truth as a, an expression of God. So... How will you come to me, Lord? How will I know you? How will I recognize you? I know you will come for me. You will slip into my being, perhaps in the middle of the night while I sleep. Maybe you will come for me when I'm not looking for you, when I'm distracted, staring into an oncoming storm, fear, fearing my immortality. Or maybe you will come to me in the midst of a lie that pours out of my mouth effortlessly. You will let me know you are listening as I listen to myself. Say something that is not true as easily as if I were giving the time of day. I tell myself that my lies are insignificant, that they don't matter. How do I know what matters, what is significant? What if I am being tested, observed? Did you know I put my conscience to sleep years ago? Maybe that's how you will come to me. You will awaken my conscience like a sleeping dragon one day when I am weakened by disease or fear or loneliness, and I will be forced to face the truth that I fear you. I fear truth. You are truth itself, and I feel that power rumble like an earthquake through my being each time my eyes look into the eyes of another human being. One word of truth ex exchanged through the eyes of another is enough to bond two human beings for eternity, the power of a sacred union. No wonder we fear truth. No wonder we fear you. How will you come to me, Lord? 
You will come through truth. You will make me need you, and I will come searching. You will make me shed my skin, my illusions, my weaknesses, like boils ready to burst on my burning flesh. And then when I am broken, too weak to deceive even myself, there you will be, already resurrecting my soul. Wow. Silence. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. Thank you for the interview. Mm, thank you for this delicious moment spent with you, and I will treasure this interview. Well, it's my pleasure. And let me say, I think what you're doing is so magnificent. You should be congratulated traveling around and archiving so many people. Well done, you. Mm. Thank you. And thank you to everybody watching. Thank you for your support and spreading these type of videos around the planet, around the world. Send you much, much love from uh, beautiful Chicagoland. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> thank you, Carolyn. Bye. <laughs>